Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Well, well, take your Bible, if you will, and I want you to look with me this morning to Hebrews chapter number three. Hebrews chapter three, you said, Pastor, you're going backwards. Well, just for today, and uh, this is the um, time that we look at our values. Uh, if you remember, we start out every January with focused outreach and biblical truth and Christ-centered worship. Today, we're approaching the value of intentional care. And uh, I am going to warn you, I'm going to be a lot more different today than I normally am during the approach to the scriptures. Uh, so it, it, Hebrews is a powerful word. And uh, I want you to watch with me in that third chapter and the 12th verse. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12, he says, Take heed, brethren. In other words, uh, be alert. Be on guard. Be vigilant. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. In other words, there's some folks that you need to be on guard and, and vigilant about that may be on the verge of drifting away from God. Verse 13, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So the whole message here in these two verses is a lot different than probably what you, um, probably what you think may be uh, said here. And I'm going to get that in just a few minutes. Uh, you ever heard the term, mind your own business? Uh, you know, a lot of people live their life like that, just minding their own business. That's one of those little cliches and euphemisms that, uh, we all grew up, I, I was sitting in the office with uh, one of the staff this week and uh, I, I made one of those mountain phrases and uh, he looked at me like uh, I knew immediately when he looked at me, he, he didn't have a clue what I'd said. And uh, we're talking about my mom, he had asked about my mom and I said, well, she's tough as a pine knot. <laughs> well, he didn't have a clue what I meant. And, and so I had to explain to him and, and then he went on to just really bless me and said, you know, I just kind of keep a record of all of that stuff that you say trying to figure it out. Um, but anyway, we, we grew up with things like actions speak louder than we, we don't bite the hand that, yeah, if you can't say anything good, there you go. Don't cry over mm -hmm. what goes around. I never understood half that stuff while I was growing up. I, I really didn't. Um, here, here's one. It, it's not over till the fat lady sings. I've been looking for that fat woman. I, I, don't, I don't know what that means. I, I have no idea. What, what's good for the goose is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's it. Now, my mom, bless her heart, I told her I was going to do this, and she threatened me within an inch of my life, but she's not here, so we'll, we'll be all right. Um, but my brother and sister and I uh, get really tickled at one of the things that she says. Now she's neck deep in the midst of something and uh, be telling us about it, but I ain't getting in it. <laughs> now what she's really saying is, I'm just gonna mind my own business. Hmm? That, that's uh, the way a lot of us probably live our lives. Um, how many, of, we, we kind of do a little survey here. Um, how, how many of you have a privacy fence around some part of your property. How many of you have caller ID? Mm -hmm. See, that's part of it. Um, how many of you know at least 10 names of the people in your neighborhood? How many of you have an alarm system? See. You understand that's part of this philosophy that uh, we're just going to mind our own business. But do you know that that's not biblical? Today I'm hoping to eradicate that because God's word really is the antithesis of all of that stuff of minding our own business. The word of God says, I want you to treat other people as the way that I have treated you. Powerful word. Now that's easy to say, but the fact of the matter is it's 
really difficult when it comes time to really carrying it out because the fact is, is we would like to live our life as an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth because that is the natural way to go about life. The scriptural and spiritual way to go about it is just the opposite of that. Jesus in, in, in has taught us, God's word has taught us, forgive as I have forgiven you. In fact, of the matter is what goes through our mind is they, they don't deserve the forgiveness. They don't deserve that. Well, um, it's about that time when it hits my head that I remember how undeserving that I really am. Can I get a witness from anybody in the house? Now, if you really want to know what kind of vertical relationship, if you really want to know how your relationship is with God, all you've got to do is look at the horizontal relationships that you have here in this life because the horizontal relationships are the measuring stick as to the relationship that you have with the Lord. They dictate that. Now, I want to get to the point in the scripture today and, and, and show us that we need to deepen both of those, the vertical as well as the horizontal. How many of you um, have uh, been told to mind your own business? Or maybe you've told somebody else, mind your own business. Well, I'm going to give you that opportunity today. It uh, goes like this, a little bit of a narrative, and you, and you come in on the heels of that and let it be said. Hey, Joe, I've been noticing at work, you've been hanging around that new girl at work, and I noticed that you guys went to lunch together the other day, and I've noticed that there's a, a, a lot of intimacy going on. That I, I just wonder, Joe, does your wife know what's going on? Mind your own business. Hey, Sue, every time that I come to your house, I experience a tremendous amount of pressure every time. And, and Sue, there's a tremendous amount of tension in your home. Mind your own business. Not long after Kathy and I got married, uh, we had to come home for a funeral from Colleen. And uh, I, I just I did one of the stupidest things I think that I've ever done in all my born days. Um, I bought her a poodle. <laughs> a little black thing. And we did the 19 hour trip back to Colleen and had the poodle in the car. And, I didn't know about dogs much then. Don't, don't know a whole lot about them now, but it, this is long before this new modern era of how to train dogs and how to treat dogs and that kind of thing. And, and, and I didn't realize that. I know what it is now. I didn't know what it was then, but that poodle had major separation anxiety. Now, I don't know what dog, dog psychiatrist came up with that, but all I know is, is that when I got back home after working during the day and having left that dog in the home by its, my, my apartment was decimated by that poodle. Now, I just did things the old way. I, I mean, I, you know, we had dogs uh, when I grew up in, up in Cedar Mountain, and, and, and I didn't know how to train a dog. I just did it the way that I had been, you know, modeled for, and, and so I'd get that poodle by the nap of the neck and I'd go rub its nose in whatever it is he tore up and I'd take a take a, a newspaper and I'd smack him on the nose that's just training the and, and I know I know just cool it we just I know but that's all I knew well after a while I'd come home and the first thing would happen with that old dog he, he, he just shied away from me completely when you get into this thing of minding your own business, it kind of develops because you tried to help somebody along the way and it backfired in your face. And now then when you see something like that, you just kind of back off into a corner and you just kind of shy away uh, from the responsibility at all. Maybe you're watching some old boy, he's about ready to make one of the most horrific financial decisions that you, you, you think that anybody could make it, and you know that if he goes in that direction, he's really going to mess it up bad. It's not going to end up good for him. But because of what's happened in the past, you mind your own business. Maybe you see somebody dating somebody, and uh, you, you know some, some history about that, and you know 
this is not going to end up well. They're about ready to make the most huge mistake that they've ever made in their life. And instead of going and just lovingly and gently and kindly confronting you shy away because you want to mind your own business. Um, the Christian response to some of that is a little bit different. The Christian response is, well, I know what I'm going to I'm just going to turn that over to God. I'm going I'm to pray about it, and God will handle it. God will take care of it. I'll let God fix this issue for us. And then, of course, we all have had the experience at church at somewhere along the way, whether it's in a small group setting or in a prayer meeting, when somebody wants to make what they have seen a matter of a prayer request. And they'll start out by saying, well, now, you know, I'm not going to mention anybody's name. If I mentioned their name, you would know who I was talking about. And, and, and I'm not going to say their name, but it sounds like Wenda. <laughs> Wenda's messing up, y'all. We need to pray for Wenda. We, we, we just need to seek God for Wenda. She's, she's down there at her job and she's got so close to her boss and, and I know that this, this stuff's fixing to happen. Wouldn't God there be somebody in that small group and, and that would probably say it out loud, well, have you talked to Linda? And then you hear the other person say, no, I haven't talked to her. I, 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 I'm just telling you, I don't want her to wind up like Kim. Y'all all remember what Kim did. We just need to pray. Well, we ought to pray. C.S. Lewis said, I often pray for others when I should be doing things for them. I suspect that there are many inside the church, many outside the church that are making some bad decisions that as a child of God, as a brother or sister in Christ, as somebody who has intentional care about them, you need to make it your business. Their business needs to become your business. I wonder if we would take a poll in the congregation today and ask the question, how many of you sitting here under the sound of my voice right now wish that somewhere along the way, back in your past, somebody had got in your business to have kept you from making some wrong judgments and wrong calls and wrong choices. You wish somebody had come walking into your life, speaking truth into your life. My hand goes up first. We all have. Now, you say, preacher, where do you get this stuff? Well, I get it right out of the word of God, which I read a few minutes ago. So I want you to watch this with me now because this scripture doesn't say what you think it says. So he says in verse 12, watch out, take heed, be aware, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And here's the part that we're going to just kind of focus in on for a few minutes. But exhort one another. Now, your translation may say encourage one another. And then we get the idea of this exhortation and this encouragement that it's high-fiving somebody or patting them on the back or sending them a kind word, some kind of way to make them feel better about themselves. No, that's not what this scripture says at all. As a matter of fact, it's a whole lot just the opposite of that. It means to beg. It means to urge. It means to make a major appeal to that person. I beg you, I plead with you, don't continue going in the same direction that you're going because if you do, you're going to wind up with a hard heart and you're going to drift away from God. It means for the child of God to get in somebody else's business. Step out of your comfort zone. Appeal to, beg, encourage, admonish, whatever you got to do to get that person that's going in that direction to turn around and go into another direction. Now, how many of you have seen some drifters in your life? 
I mean, we all have seen them. We've, we've seen them as they were so filled with the Holy Spirit of God, they were major witnesses for the cause of Christ, stood before Sunday school classes, taught the Word of God with the unction and the anointing of the Holy Spirit on their life. And I'm telling you, you just felt like you were in the presence of the Lord when you were with them, but now where are they? They're nowhere near God. As a matter of fact, they've drifted completely away from God. We all know them. There's 7,000 members of First Baptist Indian Trail, over 7,000. Where are they today? Drifted away from God. Not where they need to be. Well, what happened? What happened to their life? Well, today I want to talk to you about how to let somebody else's spiritual business become your spiritual business. Now, let me encourage you here. <laughs> this is not my idea. I didn't come up with this. This is strictly in the Word of God. So you ready? Here we go. Number one, be ready. Here's the deal. People don't just wake up in the morning and decide that they're going to walk away from God. People don't just wake up in the morning and decide, you know what, um, all this stuff about Jesus, the virgin birth, the sinless life, death, burial, resurrection, the Bible, church, Oh, I'm, I'm just going to quit. I'm going to chunk it. I'm going to lay it aside. I'm out of here. They, they just, you just don't wake up in the morning and abandon your belief system. No. It starts with a little compromise here and a little compromise there. And these little compromises become big compromises. For instance, the 15-year-old who goes to the True Love Weights campaign and signs the card, I'm going to remain pure until the day that I walk down the aisle and I give myself to the one that God has reserved for me. They go have dinner with their dad, sit across the restaurant table, and dad slips on a promise ring that says I'm going to be pure until the day that I am married. But then the dating starts and in the midst of that dating experience, the pressures begin to mount and there's a little compromise here and a little compromise there and, 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 and all of a sudden, what was so important doesn't seem so important. Who does God think he is? Did God invent sex? And then church becomes boring, irrelevant, and all of a sudden they are completely away from church. I don't need that anymore. Don't have to be 15, you may be 50. You've got this major business opportunity that has come your way, but there's a little shadiness in the midst of it that calls you to walk away from uh, the decisions of integrity and character, but you get to thinking, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity, uh, and if I don't latch onto it now, I may never get that opportunity again, and so I'm gonna yield here to this, I'm gonna go ahead, I know it's probably not what God wants for me in my life, but, but, but this is gonna yield me a lot of money, and so I'm gonna go make that decision, and sure enough, makes the decision, sure enough, the business flourishes, and now, requires so much time and so much energy and the emphasis is so great no longer has time for the things of God. We, we watched that when we were in school in that old frog experiment, right? You, you can't throw a frog into a pot of boiling water it'll just hop back so you put it in just room temperature and then you turn the heat up gradually and before you know it, he's just acclimated to the surroundings that are in him and it finally ends up destroying his life. That, that, that's exactly the principle. You watch these kids, but somewhere between 80 and 90% of all high school kids in this country graduate high school, but they get into college and they buy into the world's belief system. And before you know it, they don't need God. They don't need church anymore. And they've drifted away. I watch it periodically right out of this church and in culture in general. And it ends that we get into a health kick and we want to get into the gym. And so we buy the gym membership and, and we get in there into a regular basis and suddenly uh, our friendships begin to develop and our value systems begin to change as we are around those people. And before we know it, we are on a Saturday night holding a bottle of beer in our hand at a strip club and we've walked away and we have drifted from God. 
But everybody thinks that their situation is unique. And they'll make statements like, well, pastor, you just don't understand. Never had a deal come my way like this before. Pastor, it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and, and I, I love this. And, and, and you just have to understand, Pastor, I am on my own spiritual, personal journey now. May I say to you this morning, people, that uh, the nature of sin's deceitfulness is not unique at all. It is very predictable, but what is unique? is when a Christian brother or a Christian sister sees the direction of somebody else's life and uniquely involves themselves into that situation and lovingly and gently get into that situation to guide them back before they veer off that path, wind up with a hard heart and alienated from God. And what's unique is, is they were never asked to get involved to begin with. Is that they just went in because God had already told them to. The deceitfulness of sin is so whacked. You, you can't see it from your own perspective. If, if, you under, if you could, then we wouldn't go that. But it, 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 the deceitfulness of sin kind of blinds the person that's involved and it really takes somebody on the outside looking in on the inside of our life to be able to see what's really going on and expose it to us. Some of you are experts. You see that stuff coming from a mile away and you see somebody's life that is going down the tubes and God's word is teaching us here this morning, be ready, be alert, be sensitive, be vigilant. Second thing I wanna show you this morning is be responsive. This, this text in Hebrews is so Powerful, He says, I want you to get into this not minding your own business thing to keep people from drifting. And when you see it before your eyes, then you're to respond as the body of Christ to be involved. Turn, turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Powerful passage. Um, I wish I could read all of it, but I, for the sake of time this morning, I want... But beginning in verse 12 yourself, uh, for as the body is one, say the word one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we're baptized into one body. Doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, whether you're a slave or whether you're free, have been all made to drink into one spirit for the body is not one member but many. Here's the deal. In being a part of the body of Christ, we belong to each other and we need each other. And when one part of the body of Christ is in pain, then the rest of the body of Christ must respond to help in the midst of that one member's suffering and in their pain and respond to it. Watch this with me. Let's just suppose that I spring a leak in my carotid artery and I start to bleed. My eyes see it. Tell the brain. Brain, there's a problem over here in the artery. It's bleeding. The brain responds by saying, by the way, he doesn't say to the foot because he knows that the foot is useless in that situation. He didn't say, foot, go put pressure. He says to the right hand, uh, go put pressure on that breech to keep it from bleeding. What if the hand said, well, I, I'm really, I've got a hangnail here and I don't even like necks to begin with. What, what's ultimately going to happen? The person is going to bleed to death because part of the body did not respond accordingly. How do you translate that over spiritually? When somebody is making those compromises and those choices and decisions that are leading them to drift away from God, if the body of Christ does not respond accordingly, 
the same thing is going to happen to that person spiritually. Now here's where we get to. I can hear it coming right out of the minds of all of you sitting here. The objections that automatically occur. Well, Pastor, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, but that sure is awkward. You know, you're right. As a matter of fact, it's very awkward. And there is no unawkward way to go about it if you want to know the truth. But you do it gently, you do it lovingly, and you go to the person, you try to help them through that, and if they don't receive it, then it's just their problem. You did your part. But the body of Christ doesn't just let another part of the body just drift away and do nothing about it. The body doesn't turn its back on another part of the body and let them drift away. Another objection. Well, I'm no angel myself. Uh, how in the world would somebody who's like me qualify to worm their way into somebody else's life? Why, I would be the biggest hypocrite in the world if I were to do that. Well, let's pretend for just a minute that that is a valid argument. Then you have to assume that the only one who is qualified to get involved in somebody else's business is that person has to be perfect. That has never drifted away. That doesn't understand the issues. Let, let me ask you a question. How many of you would stand up this morning and say, well, I'm perfect. I have never drifted away from God. I've always made right decisions and choices and I've, I've never gotten cold hearted at all. Would you please stand? Well, if you stood, I have a brand new ministry for you. It's called Liar, Liar, Pants on Fire. That person doesn't exist. The fact is that no one here is qualified to get involved in somebody else's life. Understand something, this is not my idea. This is what God the Father says, I am assigning you, not just to pray something for that person, but to say something to that person. Here's the deal. You ever thought that if you did, you might save that person's marriage? I can't tell you the numbers of times that the Holy Spirit of God laid a marriage on my heart. Go sit down in their home. Had no invitation by them. And speak into their heart and their life. It, it, it is phenomenal. Did you, you, you think that somewhere along the way God could use you to save a marriage, to save a life, to save somebody from sin, to save their business, if you would just take the assignment that God has given to us as part of the body of Christ? I'll ask you a question this morning. Who do you know right now personally? Who do you know? And when I ask this question, their face pops into your mind. Who do you know this morning that is beginning to drift? Now, don't run out of the church after the service is over and pick up the phone and say, hey, sinner, I need to come talk to you. But somewhere along the way, lovingly and gently, with compassion and humility, come to the place you say, you know, I'm, I'm really not comfortable in doing this. It's really not uh, something that I cherish or enjoy. But I love you and I care about you. And if I were in the opposite seat, I would want somebody to come in and talk to me. And I just want to ask you about a few things. And try your best to gently, lovingly bring that person back to where they need to be in their relationship with God. Fact is, listen to this, listen to this. You don't know what's going on in their life. It could be a distinct possibility that they've been in a posture of prayer praying about their own plight and their own circumstance 
and saying, God, would you send somebody that I could talk to about this? But, but they may be saying, God, I, I'm looking for a sign. I'm not sure if I'm getting ready to make the right decision or not. So God, would you send somebody to talk to me about it? You, you don't know what's going on in your life. Let, let me give you the last one. You ready? It's be receptive. Got to be ready. You got to be responsive. And then you got to be receptive. Okay, here's a key question. How many of you sitting here today have people in your life that you have freed up, granted permission, opened the door, and said to them, if you see me going down a path that I ought not to be going, if you see a trend in my life, if you see something in me that is displeasing unto God, I want you to come and I want you to tell me about it. I have five men in my life right now, five, that I have verbally and authoritatively said to these five men, you see anything in me, I expect you to tell me about it. I had an agreement with, with another guy years and years ago, just hit my mind while I'm preaching this morning. And he and I had that agreement. We, we were golfing buddies. We, we played golf almost every week. And, and almost every week we would, we would say something to the effect, hey man, if you see me going in a direction that I don't need to be going, and, and, and no, here, here's exactly how it was said, if I get out there, you come and get me exactly what was said guess what he got out there guess what I went to get him guess what he didn't come and I I'm just encouraging you free up somebody in your life to come and speak into your life keep you from drifting Proverbs says the wounds of a friend are better than many kisses from an enemy I suspect there's somebody here today that needs a good smack upside the head for somebody just to come speak truth and honesty into your life. You know, I want that. Because I don't want to be deceived by sin. I don't want to develop a hard heart. I certainly don't want to drift from God. Proverbs 27 says, as iron sharpens Iron so one man sharpens another. Every one of you men ought to be in that Friday night meeting that we're going to have this Friday night challenging one another and seeing the walls and the barriers come tumbling down and just getting honest and real before God. Every one of us men need to be in that meeting. You know, you know what is the opposite? If you don't get sharp, what do you get? Dull. We need each other, men. There are three types of people that are listening to this message right now. There's somebody here today that's on the verge of drifting. Can I speak just a word to you this morning? <laughs> Ask somebody for help. Seek out somebody that you respect. Seek out somebody that you know is not going to be judgmental. Seek out somebody that's going to be good enough and kind enough and loving enough to tell you the truth. There's a second person here today that's listening to this message and that is the person who is sitting here this morning and you're already thinking about somebody that is drifting away from God. Somebody that you need to go speak with. Somebody that you need to go confront. Somebody that you need to go and exhort. There's a third person here today and that's the person who doesn't have a clue in the world what a lot of this stuff means because you've never been connected to God. You've never had a relationship with the Lord Jesus. You've never encountered him. And today you, you're thinking to yourself, man, that's, it sounds good. I don't understand all of it, but it sure sounds good. I wish I had that kind of family. I wish I had that kind of relationship. I wish I had that kind uh, of encouragement coming my way. Well, you can have. If you just get to the point that you're willing to turn away from sin and you're willing to admit that your sin has separated you from God and you by faith turn away from sin and place your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you can know what it means to be part of the family and the body of Christ. So which one is it for you? On the verge of drifting 
know somebody that is drifting, or you don't know Christ as your Savior and Lord. I encourage you, I admonish you, I exhort you this morning. Make it right with God. Would you stand with me? Matthew's going to come. He's going to lead us in a hymn of invitation. As the Holy Spirit deals with you here, I pray that you'll be responding accordingly. Some of you just need to come find a place to pray and say, you know what? I'm nowhere near as close to God as I used to be and I've, I made some tough decisions that I know probably didn't please God. And just come and say, you know what, God? I don't want to drift. I don't want that hard heart. I, I, I don't want that. And so, God, I want you to renew me today. I, I, I want to develop that life of character and integrity and, and, and come and just find that place to pray. Come and find a place to pray for somebody that you know is drifting and for the opportunity that God may give you to go speak into their life. I encourage you to come. And if you don't know Jesus, if you don't know Christ, if you don't have the assurance that when you die, you're going to go to heaven. Come let me speak with you before you go home. Let me share with you how you can have your sins forgiven, how you can know Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, get glory in this invitation. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.